Um, we want to start a new topic uh, that we call non-linear regression. Uh, this can actually be found in chapter 11 of the textbook. Uh, before now, we've been working on linear regression. And of course, uh, we could have situation, you know, some kind of situation in life, ranging from biological situation to agricultural to economy, uh, you know, where the relationship may be, may not be linear. So how do we now actually, you know, um, undertake, you know, when relationship is not linear, I'm actually going to walk you through some fundamental principle of that. Okay. Uh, in the outline, of course, I'm going to be introducing you to a nonlinear model. And I'm also going to differentiate between two types of nonlinear model. We have the intrinsically linear and intrinsically nonlinear. Then um, some, you know, different form of linear models that we have from logistic growth model to exponential growth model to, uh, you know, market list maintain model of the way to bound battle group models. So all of these are classified under nonlinear models. Okay, so uh, in the introduction, I'm going to first tell you that nonlinear model is an extension or a generalization of a linear regression model. Okay, uh, except that uh, the mean function is not going to be a linear one. The mean, the mean function is basically um, going to be highly complicated. Okay, and let me tell you this: we there are several advantages of using nonlinear model, okay? It gets, uh, you know, the, the linear uh, model, uh, the advantages of that, number one, parsimony. Parsimony. You know, parsimony is talking about few parameters. You know, instead of you to be adding a lot of parameters in your model, in case of linear, maybe you needed a, uh, a nonlinear function. And of course, um, with a nonlinear function, the parameters are kind of reduced. Okay, then another advantage of that is interpretation. You know, it, 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 let me interpretability. Of course, when you have few parameters, of course, uh, your modules will be interpretable. And the lastly is prediction. Prediction. Uh, those of you online, can you confirm if you can see what I'm writing on the board? Yes. Can you confirm all of that? Okay, thank you. So these are the advantages. Advantages of non-linear model. You know, the disadvantage of non-linear model uh, is it has to do with the complete, you know, the complexity. Okay, the complexity. But the moment you really understand how we can actually go about it, how we can navigate that, it's basically going to be fine. Okay. Now, let me just say that, generally speaking. The nonlinear model can be classified into intrinsically linear and intrinsically nonlinear. What do I mean by intrinsically linear? Intrinsically linear means the model is actually nonlinear, but when I transform that, it becomes linear. <laughs> I'm going to say that again. Intrinsically linear model, it means the models are, are nonlinear probably nonlinear in variables. And by the time we actually, um, you know, transform that, you know, when you transform a model, maybe uh, you just log read in or square root or whatever to transform that, then you attain linearity, okay? Provided you have a linearity in parameter, 
you still have a, even though you could have a nonlinear invariable, okay, I'm going to say that again. You may have a nonlinear invariables, but the moment you have linear in parameters, you're still talking about linear. I'm going to say that again. You could have a nonlinear invariables, but if the parameters are linear, then you have linear. So when I'm trying to stay by intrinsically or linear model, uh, naturally they are non-linear, but by the time I transform that, you know, transforming that is to attain linearity. Transforming then is attain linearity. When I transform that and I attain linearity, then we call that intrinsically non-linear model. But what about intrinsic, uh, sorry, intrinsically linear model? I mean, so they are called intrinsically linear model. I'm going to say that again. Initially, they were non-linear. When we transform them, they become linear. Then we can call that intrinsically linear model. But what if in a situation where we transform them and they refuse <laughs> to attain linearity? I'm going to say that again. You transform them and they did not attain linearity then we're going to call them intrinsically non-linear model. In statistical analysis, intrinsically non-linear model are highly complicated model because it's basically going to be easy if I have a non-linear model and I transform that, it becomes linear. I will basically use the, non -con you know, the conventional linear approach. But situation where I actually do that, it doesn't work. Then I will have to seek redress in mathematics, where I'm actually going to go for the use of iterative. Okay, I'm going to use algorithm. That's why algorithm is going to come in now, where I need to have a very good initial value, then where I need to put into consideration the convergence. Does that make sense? Okay. Now I'm showing you an example of that. Take a look at what I'm showing you now. Uh, log into one minus y i divided by y i or uh, equal the b1 plus b2 x i plus uh, u i. If you take a look at the first one, okay, this is more or less an intrinsically linear, okay? Because you know why it is intrinsically linear, even though it is non-linear in, in, in variable, you can see one minus y i over y i log of that, but it is linear in parameters. What are the parameters? B1, B2. Now take a look at the second one. When you take a look at the second one now, okay, uh, give me one second. So when you take a look at uh, those of you online, uh, in case you are not seeing what I put on the board, please uh, make sure you, you let me know, okay? If you are not seeing what I'm going to put on the board. Now, if you take a look at the, uh, the second one, I got yi equal, you know, yi equal uh, b1 uh, x2i raised to power beta 2, and I got uh, x, x3i uh, raised to power beta 3, and I actually got exponential raised to the power u i, or u i. Take a look at that. Okay, even though this is looking like a non-linear, right? If I transform uh, this guy now, okay, I can transform by taking the logarithm of both sides. When I take uh, the logarithm of both sides, of course, I'm actually going to have this guy and the lean of all of that, and if I take this as a separate uh, entity, this a separate entity, okay? I'm actually going to have four of that where I'm actually going to have this plus, you know, that will be that uh, lean x to i, uh, b3 lean x3 i, and u i, if, uh, if the linear I'm to is a natural log. Where I'm actually going to call this guy, okay? It's more or less like a, like a, like a constant alpha. Okay, what have I done now? This is an example of intrinsically linear model. They were not linear initially, but when I transform that, 
taking the log reading of both sides, uh, that actually return, uh, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the model architecture back to linear, where you can see it is now linear in parameter. Any question? Is an example of intrinsically uh, linear model. Oh, give me one second. Let me see how that one is going to go. Okay, now, if that is what you have now, any question on this, on a physically linear? Any question? On a physically linear model? Okay, you are all good, right? Okay, now I'm going to go to the next one. Take a look at uh, this guy now. Okay, where I have this, but this time around, you know, uh, that is being multiplied by a UI. And I decided to take the log of all of that. Okay, even though I still have, uh, you know, linear in parameters, but the way error enters into the model is different. If you take a look at this, the error enters into that model in an additive way, right? But if you take a look at the other one, errors enter into the model multiplicative way. Because the way error enters into the model matter. I'm going to say that again. The way error enters into the model also matter. Okay? I wanted to take note, uh, you know, of that. Okay, take a look at this now. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. There is no amount of, there's no uh, amount of effort that you can actually apply on this that will become linear. Take a look at that. Even if you introduce log, okay? If you basically introduce log, this is not going to be linear. Therefore, this is looking like a Cobb Douglas uh, model in economics, a model that has to do with labor input, capital input, and the like. So this is non, this is intrinsically non-linear model. Intrinsically non-linear model because when you transform that, it's not, it's not going to be. Uh, it's not going to it's not going to attain linear. You're not going to have linear in parameter. You're still going to have uh, because take a look at what is what you have in the middle plus. You got a plus in the middle. You know when you have a multiplication, that would be so that would be so easy, right? When you when you introduce a log, it's just going to be additive, right? But this time around, you got a positive in the middle. This is an example of intrinsically non-linear model. But let me tell you this. Uh, we have a special way of solving non-linear model, okay? Except that we cannot use the conventional linear approach. It is only uh, when we have intrinsically linear model, you know, we maybe the model that are, no, are naturally non-linear, and we transform them, they become linear, we can still use the conventional linear approach. But right now, since uh, we have a model that is naturally non-linear, and no amount of effort that can bring back to linearity. When I say linearity, I mean linear in parameter, which means there's no way this can be linear in parameter. Then we're going to call them intrinsically non-linear model. And if they are intrinsically non-linear model, we cannot use the conventional linear approach. We have to go iterative. We have to use algorithm. We have to consider the convergence. We have to look at the initial value to start with a very good initial point. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, you know, the takeaway from what I've just revealed to you today, we got generally speaking, we got two types of nonlinear model, the intrinsically linear and the intrinsically nonlinear. Intrinsically linear and nonlinear model that can be transformed into linear. And when, they, when we transform them into linear, we can use a linear approach to estimate parameters in such model. But intrinsically non-linear is the one that you cannot transform into the linear form. And of course, we have to you know, look beyond the method of linearity you know, to solve a problem. We have to go for um, optimization technique in mathematics. Now, when you take a look at these two, you know, when you take a look at the first one, of course, uh, the first one is linear. As you can see, but take a look at the second one. 
The second one is, is, not, is intrinsically not linear, okay? Uh, as you can, you know, when you take a look at uh, uh, what you have, because between them, you can see plus mu or ui, okay? But when you take a look at the first one, that's just a linear, that's the linear, okay? The second one is looking like an exponential model. Has anybody heard about exponential model? When something is just increasing without bound, a lot of people believe that, uh, you know, at the beginning of the epidemics, it's just going to be going exponential, right? It's going to be, you know, where you're going to have a good number of uh, people that may fall sick when they get exposed, stuff like that. Okay, now uh, I want to show you, uh, you know, when you talk about nonlinear model, most of the biological occurrences, agricultural occurrences, even when we talk about the relationship between the price of a stock and time, is actually nonlinear. Okay. Now, when you talk about growth model, we talk about growth like population growth. That's a nonlinear. What, I, what I'm presenting to you now is a logistic growth model. Logistic growth model. Okay. Uh, you know, you have a y equal to ms theta plus the error. The ms of theta here is what is given, where you have a t the parameters here are theta 1, theta 2, theta 3. This is non-linear. You know, whether you whether you would talk about linear or non-linear, there's always going to be a, a place of a stochastic component, which you call the error. The same way we are minimizing the unexplained variation in a linear situation, we also want to do that with a nonlinear situation as well. And that's why you can see plus the error time. Take a look at that. This is, this is an example of a logistic or growth model where the theta one here is going to be called a, like a carrying capacity of the population. Theta one now, the carrying capacity of a population. Now, take a look at this. Now, if I generally speaking, if I have a nonlinear model, uh, I'm actually going to use a nonlinear least square. If I want to estimate uh, parameters in such model, the same way that I use a linear least, square, you know, when I use a, like I use a, a least square for linear, we also have a nonlinear least square. What does a nonlinear least square do? Can we have a way to minimize the sum of square error? Whether I, I told you the other time, whether in linear or non-linear, we always want to minimize the sum of square error, which we call the unexplained variation. And that's exactly what we do. Take a look at equation two now. The equation two is actually uh, summation W into that of squared, which means uh, there's going to be a weight. You remember we did a weighted least square, right? <laughs> there's going to be a weight here too. Okay, and of course, uh, we basically want to minimize the residual sum of squared. We want to estimate the parameters. Like, if I want to talk about logistic regression mode now, I mean logistic growth mode now, where I got theta one, theta two, theta three, then I'm going to use a nonlinearly squared. Then I will be able to estimate the value for theta one, theta two, theta three. But I was able to estimate, I was able to get those values, you know, you know, by way of minimizing the sum of square error. And that's why the optimization is going to come in. We're going to borrow certain idea from mathematics. And that's why I used to tell my friend that you can't be a very sound statistician without having the knowledge of math. Okay. Now. I want to use this in the population now. Population, you know, you know, if I know the population of a country, can I have a way to the, you know, to predict what the population is going to be in the next uh, five years or ten years? Of course, a uh, logistic uh, uh, growth model can handle that. It is not only logistic growth model that we have; we got a lot of them. In fact, I've conducted a research before where I compare different kind of growth models where I want to know which one is the best for a particular country. You know, a growth model that may be the best for United States may not be the best for Germany, may not be the best for China. And that is the reason why we can actually look at growth models that we have around and we, we look at the data. 
which of the growth model is the best? How am I going to know which growth model is the best? Of course, we have a, a way to investigate looking at the error. Okay, now uh, take a look at, uh, you know, population, uh, you, know, you know, equal to the theta one divided by one plus uh, what we have now, which we call a, you know, logistical growth model. Now, when you take a look at this, if we want to solve, like, we basically want to estimate what is our theta one, what's our theta two, what's our theta three, you know what we're going to do? We need to follow force, like, we need a good initial value. If I'm actually going to use a non-linear least squared, I, I need a new initial, because uh, using that, I'm actually going to be using algorithm, but you know what I'm going to do first? I need to follow force have a very good start. A very good start is what we call the starting values. If your starting value is not great, then your, your, you know, your algorithm may not converge on time, or fact, it may not even converge. And that, you know what we're going to do? We're actually going to go statistical in a way. Let us look at this model now. Can we have a way to linearize that? When we linearize that, we can apply the method of least squared and we'll be able to get a starting point for each of the parameters. That is exactly what I'm doing here. You will know, what do you think I did? I divide both sides by theta one. Look at that. Therefore, I'm going to have a y divided by theta one equal to that. Then after that, then I'm going to solve in a way that I want my left, my right hand side to be uh, to look like a linear regression. Oh my God, is there anybody in this class who doesn't know how to derive all the way to the log y over theta one divided by one minus y over theta one equal to that? Is there anyone? Or you want me to show you how to do that? Do you understand how to do that mathematically or you want me to show you how to do that? How, because when you take a look at what I have now in the third equation now, I've been able to what? Re reposition the nonlinear model now to look like a linear in a way. Now, I believe everybody know how to do that. Okay. Uh, those of you online, uh, can you see confirm if you are see hearing me clearly? Those of you online, can you confirm? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for confirming that. Now, do you know when I have this guy now? Okay, what do I want to do with this guy now? I will now use the method of least squared, but the method of least squared that I want to do is the result that I'm going to get is not going to be, it's not going to be my final. The result that I'm actually going to get will be, we serve as the initial value, the starting value. Now, I'm going to show you my code right now. I wanted to look at my code. Now, I need to load a package called car so that I'm going to have access to the, uh, you, you know, United States population data, USPOP. I'm going to want to focus on the United States population here. And I need to load a package called car. When I load a package called car, then I'm going to write a model. Take a look at that. I'm writing the model right now. Okay, uh, I'm regressing the population with respect to year because in the United States population, I'm actually going to have you know population and a particular year. Does that make sense? The response variable in this case is actually population. Then you know collected over time. Okay, then I'm going to use my LM. But why am I introducing logit? Okay, you know, when I say LM and I say logit, why am I introducing logit? Because when you take a look at that, that's a log. That is looking like a log of the hard ratio. And that's why it's going to be a logit, not just an ordinary LM. Now, you can see that we're dividing Y by theta one, right? Okay, then you need to decide on what your theta one is going to be. Your theta one, you can assume that. That would be maximum capacity. Okay, we can say, okay, because we're dealing with the United States right now, maybe 300 and something million, let's just say 400 million. Does that make sense? That is, that is the essence of the 400 that you see. Okay, that's what we're deciding. You know, when, when you see logic, uh, let me tell you this. When you see uh, logic, when you see logit, or oh, those of you online, I think you are seeing what I'm writing, right? Okay, if you are not seeing what I'm writing, please let me know. 
when you see logit, okay, when you see logit into y over theta one, okay, you know what that means? It means log y over theta one divided by one minus y over theta one. That's what logit of this means. Does that make sense? And you know, if you that's what you see, that is what you see on the on the on the on the on the left hand side. You know, this guy is what you see on the left hand side, right? If I want to code that in R, I'm actually just going to say logit of this guy. Does there any question? Okay, now, and don't forget, even though I, I got uh, theta one, theta two, theta three, right? I'm actually going to assume a value for theta one in a logistic growth model, right? The theta one is a ma is, is, is like a something that I can call a carrying capacity. Okay, carrying capacity in a way. I can choose 400 for United States population. Okay, we are in 300 and something million now, right? They can just, okay, let's say, let's choose 400. And that was why you see uh, here, we, the population is divided by uh, 400. Then I'm regressing that on year. When I do that, I'm actually gonna have uh, intercepts to be that and then you know, slope uh, to be that. And when I have that, you know what, what that means? It means if I want to, if I actually uh, want to use a non-linear least square, the non-linear least square is the NLS. N -N non-linear, it means non-linear least square. Okay, now if I want to use non-linear least square, I need to use a very good initial values. You know how I determine my initial values now? I have to go statistical, you know, in doing that. You know, my, my initial values, uh, negative 49 is 0 0.025. Uh, where did I get that? I got that from here. Okay. Now, that's exactly what I'm going to use now. When I want to conduct the NL, you know, the, uh, you know, the multiple, uh, you know, the NLS, which I call the nonlinear least square. Take a look at that. Now, when I run that now, don't forget in my starting list, okay, I've suggested uh, initial value for theta one, 400. The theta two and the theta three were, you know, were, uh, were actually estimated uh, using the conventional approach. In the end, I'm, I'm actually going to have all these different kind of values. Take a look at that. And I'm, I'm actually um, going to conclude on where it converge, okay? So where that actually converges, this is where I'm actually going to. So when I take a look at what I got now, when I do the summary of the, the pop dot mode, you know, the pop mode actually give all this. And when you do the summary of that, okay, that will give you your theta one to be 440.83334, your theta two to be negative 42.70698, and your theta three to be that. Any question? The result is going to look like the linear regression that we've done before. Now you now have your theta now, you have your theta one, you got your theta two, you got your theta three. Any question on this? Any question? Okay. And of course in your outputs, that will give you the number of uh, convergence, number of attrition before reaching convergence. Uh, as you can see here, okay. The numbers of attrition uh, before reaching convergence is like one, two, three, four, five, six which is what he actually stated here. Take a look at that. And of course, the achieved convergent tolerance are very, very small. Take a look at that. Let me tell you, if you really want to get a good result, you need to use a, a, a very good starting initial value. Okay? Now, uh, in the end, so I said the color mark estimate display the least square estimate of the parameter. You know, I'm just trying. And I said the estimated upper bound for the US population is 440.8 or about 441 million. And the color mark standard deviation display the standard error of this estimated regression coefficient. The very stand, the very last standard error for that have been reflected your salinity in the uh, estimated institute when they observe our uh, data are much smaller than the institute. Of course, uh, you know, in uh, regression, the role of the standard error is uh, just to tell us how reliable is the estimate. Now I want to go into another uh, model, which is also very popular.
we call that uh, Michael Menten model. The is an, an example of intrinsically or uh, linear model. If if this is an example of intrinsically linear model, that would be super easy. Now, if I have y equal to that, I can do some mathematics. Okay, where I'm actually going to have one over y equal to that, and I can divide both sides by v m x. Then you know, finally, I'm having one over y equal to what I have here. Okay. So when you take a look at what I have here now, we can actually, um, you know, relate this to conventional linear regression, where I'm going to say one over VM is more or less my beta naught, and K over VM is uh, more or less my, you know, uh, beta one, and of course uh, the VM equal to that and K equal to that. Okay, you know, it is an intrinsically linear model, even though initially it was, you know, it was looking naturally like a non-linear, but uh, by the time we're able to simplify that, we are still linearity. Now, I'm actually want to use this for concentration and rates. For those in chemistry, biology, you know, they will understand what I mean. You know, where they want to look at how they can actually uh, you know, predict rates, maybe rate of reaction from the concentration. Does that make sense? The rate of reaction from concentration for those who are in, in chemistry, okay? And we have different values for concentration and we have the rate of reaction. You know, the, the better way to start is to have a plot. You know, we generate a plot between the rates and the concentration, the rate is in the y axis, the concentration is in the uh, horizontal axis. You can see a curve, right? This not, is not going to be a straight line. Okay, now, uh, because we've already, this is what we want to use a Markelis Menten model, because the Markelis Menten model has been proved to be a very good model to represent relationship between rates and the concentration, okay? So because of that, we're actually using that. So if I want to use that now, of course, my X is going to be one over concentration. If you take a look at what I have, okay? One over concentration, like one over X. You see one over X, okay? The parameter beta one is just K over VM. <laughs> you didn't take a look at that. So one over concentration is going to be my X, my new variable X. Okay. And my Y now, okay, is basically uh, one over, if you go back to the Y, okay, you can see uh, here is one over Y, right? Take a look at that. Okay. Now, and then, um, one over rate model, and my VM is actually one over the model coefficient. If you take a look at the VM, you can see the VM, right? One over beta naught, right? One over beta naught, right? And K is the ratio of beta one to the beta naught, okay? Now, when you run the model, okay? You're actually gonna have the intercept 148.2173. And you're going to have oh, this guy, OK? And when you have that, OK? You know, you may be wondering, why are we getting this guy? You know, getting this guy, that is not going to be the final result. These are going to serve as uh, the initial values. They are not going to be final results. That is different between the linear and the nonlinear, OK? Now. The, these two values now will be used. Okay, this is going to be our starting list. Okay, K will be that, VM will be that, and and you can see the way we we actually figure them out using that. That's the code. Okay, and we're going to use God's Newton iteration approach. We got different method of um, you know of um, estimating iteratively. The parameters in a nonlinear model. One of them is the Gauss-Newton iteration method. There's so many methods. I've heard about Newton-Raphson. 
that are available first position method. There's so many methods around. Okay, but right now I'm using a Gauss Newton attrition method. Okay, I actually um, I'm writing the model back. The model naturally is red on this guy here. And I say that that guy, I'm actually going to see all this. Okay. And when I see all that, or when I do the summary of that, I'm actually uh, going to have results. So this is the, uh, the plot of that. And in the end, the optimal, uh, the estimate of the values I'm actually going to have, I'm going to get for K, I'm actually going to get for, for VM. Okay, uh, that of a K was found to be 17.07906. And that one was 126. If you take a look at what I have here, it actually converge at K to be 17.0906 and 126.0329. I wanted to take note of that. And that's exactly uh, what we got. Any question? Any question on what we've done today? Any question? Today, we only, um, I walk you through an example of a nonlinear model, uh, the logistic growth model, and then uh, the Markelis uh, one, okay, the Markelis maintain one. And the only takeaway from what we've done today, okay, when we have uh, a nonlinear model, Okay, we basically need to for first look for a way to linearize that so that we can use the conventional linear approach so that we'll be able to estimate uh, the initial values, which are the starting point, because you need to have a very good initial value if you want to use a nonlinear least square. What we still want to use is a nonlinear least square, which means this time around. We be, I'm actually calling this a three a three step uh, three three step process. Why am I calling it a three step process? Step number one, we go mathematical, trying to reposition the nonlinear architecture to look like a linear. That's going to be the step one. Uh, the step two now is to use a conventional linear method to estimate the parameters the values of the parameter. And the values of the parameter, that is not the final destination. That would be the starting values. Then the final step now is to use the nonlinear least squared. And in the nonlinear least squared that I need to state the values of the initial values that I got in step two. Okay? And the moment I obtain those values now, then I can use the module to make a prediction. And of course, I also said, um, there are two types of nonlinear model. Generally speaking, we have intrinsically linear, we have intrinsically nonlinear, and of course, uh, we use a method of uh, nonlinear least squared. Okay, and today we focus on the growth model. We also focus on the relationship between the rates and the concentration. You know, for those of you in chemistry, in a bi in biology, where you actually um, had um, Maybe atom together, you know, looking at it. I know some, you know, some, um, or some, some, some are diluted, some are concentrated. Okay. And if I want to look at the effect of the concentration on the rates, maybe the rate of reaction. Okay. What are we going to do next? We're actually going to visit another important model, growth model, which we call Val Batalafi. Von Batalafi growth model is very, very useful in predicting uh, animals in a bush, like a fish, okay? So we may want to know uh, whether some animals have become extinct, okay? We, uh, so we should be able to have a way to use what I call a capture the capture method. But I want to tell you a very good model to, uh, you know, to estimate uh, the, whether the, the length of the animals or, or the weight, okay, whether the length of the animal or the weight, of course, we're going to use a von Batalafi. Okay, putting into consideration the age of the animal. We, you know, we, we could have some, at times, why is it a nonlinear? 
I've seen somebody who age who who actually have maybe um that is older and even way way less than somebody who is younger. <laughs> so you know along the line uh you know uh, from bats when the age is going up the weight is going to be going up but it's going to get to a point depending on individuals that there's going to be a curve it's going to be the other way around and of course the best model we can use for that is uh, one of the best model there are different kind of models that one can use to estimate the length of a fish or the growth or the weight of a fish why is the length and the growth of a, of a fish important important to us because the, you know at times the more the weight or the more the length you know that could uh, that could mean more economic value i know those in alaska <laughs> they go to they want more length or more weight you get what i mean right and that's why what we're going to do next uh, is going to focus on what is it now what is an important nonlinear model that we're using or we, so that's why we're focusing, we're fully focusing on Val Bantalafi model. Okay, in our next class. Is there any question? This is gonna be the end of the lecture today. Like I said on Thursday, uh, I'm actually gonna upload your meet and choose score. But but what I've been seeing, you know, you know, we're grading, those results are looking promising. <laughs> you guys are doing great. Okay, make sure you stay safe and have a lovely day. Bye for now, everyone. Oh, uh, I think somebody said I should make clarification about. Uh, let me let me check the chat. I think I still have like five minutes. Somebody said, could you explain problem two of the homework assignments? I'm a little confused. Okay, okay. Uh, let me uh go to the homework, uh, I mean, the number two that the person is talking about. Uh, give me give me one second. I'm gonna go to the, I'm gonna go to the syllab, uh, me to be material uh, assignments eight now. So the person said number two, problem two. Okay, uh, problem two. Uh, let me see. Uh, problem two is an easy problem. So fit all possible modus approach. In this class, when you have two raised to power four modus, how many modus is that? That will be 16, right? And there was a lecture note where I consider all the modus and you get the adjusted R square for each. You get the AIC, you get the BIC. So I will refer the person to your lecture notes. You know, we've done all possible uh, modus okay so here the you're going to run all possible modus you're going to compute the adjusted r square eic and bic and what i'm asking is either do you have an agreement okay i said is there an agreement between the variables selected by this technique when i see this technique i'm referring to all possible selection okay and the and problem one you know in problem one i've asked you a question in problem one about forward selection backward elimination Okay, I think I will advise the person to go to uh, the lecture notes. Okay, I think I put all of that in the lecture notes. In fact, that's a particular example that focus on all subset uh, selection. Okay, and uh, if the person still need more clarification, I think uh, I'm actually gonna have my office hour tomorrow. You can visit with me during my office hour. I can show you the particular area in the slide. Okay, the person says, so we need system model. Yeah, you need system model. But the system model will be plus the intercept. The one I show in class was 15 modules, right? There was no intercept. Maybe I believe the intercept, the AIC for intercept was very, very high. Maybe that was the reason. So in that question, since you have four predator, you're actually going to have two raised to the power of four. We are actually going to have system modules. Okay, be sure you stay safe and have a lovely day. So bye for now, everyone.